Okay, good morning and welcome to this presentation hosted by BCL Legal in conjunction with Boyce Turner, in which we will be looking at issues to be considered at the early stages of a dispute. We will look at this in the context of a claim before the courts in England and Wales. This may be where you have a claim against your contractual counterparty, or where you yourself may be on the receiving end of a claim from your counterparty. It may be that for certain types of claim, or claims above a certain value, you might choose to instruct external solicitors at the very outset. However, in other cases, you might decide to deal with the initial stages of the dispute internally before deciding later whether or not to seek external legal advice. In this morning's presentation, we will look at some of the key steps involved at the initial stages of the dispute. First of all, we will look at the duty to preserve documents relating to the claim. This will cover the relevant rules and sanctions for failing to comply and practical steps on how to ensure that all data is safely preserved. Secondly, we will look at the issue of privilege and steps to be followed to ensure as far as possible that privilege over communications is maintained. We will also look at the position where the claim you're involved in is before a court or arbitration overseas and considerations that might apply. We'll consider the issue of factual witnesses who may be needed for the claim or the defence of the claim. And then lastly, any insurance considerations. We'll talk for just under half an hour and there may be some time for questions at the end. Otherwise, we'd be happy to answer any questions by email which you may want to send in afterwards. So I'll now pass over to my colleague Sophie McDonald, who will talk through the topic of preserving documents. Thank you, James. As soon as litigation is contemplated, the parties are under a duty under the civil procedure rules to preserve and keep all documents. The CPR does not specify the point at which litigation is contemplated. However, in the 2016 case of Astex Therapeutics and AstraZeneca, the court commented that it was obvious that litigation was in contemplation upon receipt of a letter of claim. We would therefore suggest that where you are prepared uh, and sent a letter of claim under the protocols on pre-action conduct under the CPR, or where you received such a letter of claim from your counterparty, it is reasonable to assume that litigation is in reasonable contemplation and that the requirement in the CPR to preserve documents should be observed. The documents to be preserved also include electronic documents, which would otherwise be deleted in accordance with the document retention policy, or otherwise deleted in the ordinary course of business. As we see on the slide, the Civil Procedure Rules, Practice Direction 31B, Paragraph 7, provides, as soon as litigation is contemplated, legal representatives must notify their clients of the need to preserve disclosable documents. The documents to be preserved include electronic documents, which would otherwise be deleted in, a, in accordance with the document retention policy, or otherwise deleted in the ordinary course of business. The legal representative referred to in the this paragraph would apply to in-house lawyers who are managing the litigation process where the company is not yet engaged external counsel on the dispute. It is therefore essential that processes should be put in place to preserve any documents which are disclosable or which are potentially disclosable in the proceedings. The requirement to preserve documents comprises of past, present and future information. Part 31.4 of the Civil Procedure Rules provides a document means anything in which information of any description is recorded. Documents include hard copy paper documents, such as agreements, correspondence, memos, handwritten notes, diaries and photographs. Information recorded in electronic formats are included too, for example, written communications, including emails, text messages, voicemails, information on databases, video recordings, and social media content. This does not only apply to original documents, but also copies, drafts, annotations, and notes, and it also includes electronic files that have been deleted. There is effectively no type of document that can be ignored. What is a copy? A copy is defined in part 31.4 of the Civil Procedure Rules as anything onto which information recorded in the document has been copied by whatever means and whether directly or indirectly. As we see on this slide, paragraph seven of Practice Direction 31B refers to the preservation of disclosable documents. I've set out on the slide the terms of CPR 31.6, which define the test for standard disclosure, and that is, Standard disclosure requires a party to disclose only A, the documents on which he relies, and B, the documents which adversely affect his own case, adversely affect another party's case, or support another party's case, and C, the documents which he is required to disclose by a relevant practice direction, 
At the very outset of a dispute, whether it's a claim with your company is bringing or whether your company is defending a claim brought against it, it may not be clear precisely what documents will be disclosable. Under the CPR, as the full, full detail of the claim may be unclear and potential defences may not be known and may develop over time. In order to comply with the CPR, due to, preserve, due to preserve disclosable documents, it is advisable to take a safety first approach and cast the net widely while preserving documents which may be potentially relevant to the dispute. For example, where there's been a team involved in the relevant contract or transaction, which is now the subject of the claim, all members of the team should be asked to take steps to preserve all documents in connection with the relevant contract or transaction, whether or not these documents later turn out to be disclosable. This may require the preservation of vast amounts of data in the case of a complex or long-term contract or transaction, or whether a number of related contracts. The key is that as many potentially relevant data should be harvested at the outset, and from this universe of documents, the exercise of determining which of the documents are disclosable can be carried out at a later stage. I will come on to the practical steps around document preservation later. In relation to standard disclosure, CPR 31.7 requires you to make a reasonable search for documents which meet the test for standard disclosure. The disclosure obligation requires you to disclose documents that are no longer in your possession as they've either been lost or disposed of prior to litigation. At a later stage in the process, it will be necessary for a representative of the party, and which may be the in-house lawyer managing the claim, to, to sign a disclosure certificate, which is supported by a statement of truth. This will confirm, amongst other things, the reasonable steps have been taken to preserve potentially relevant documents. Proceedings for contempt of court can be brought against a person who signs or causes to sign a false disclosure certificate without an honest belief in its truth. It's therefore extremely important that the preservation obligations are followed. Consideration needs to be taken in relation to staff leaving an organization, ensuring the laptops are not wiped and documentation is captured before employees leave a position. A pilot scheme of rules in relation to disclosure commenced on the 1st of January, 2019 for a period of two years and has it, it's been extended until the end of 2021. Thereafter, it's likely to be made permanent. The disclosure pilot scheme applies to claims dealt with by the business and property courts within the High Court. I won't go into a um, huge amount of detail on the scheme. However, I wanted to flag that the scheme has imposed an additional obligation to suspend the destruction and or deletion of documents relevant to the litigation, either in accordance with a document retention policy or in the ordinary course of business. The preservation duties include an obligation, first to suspend relevant document deletion or destruction processes for the duration of the proceedings. Secondly, to send a written notification to all relevant existing employees, but also to former employees, where there is a reason to believe they hold disclosable documents no longer in the party's possession. And thirdly, to take reasonable steps so that the agents or third parties who may hold documents on your behalf, do not delete or destroy documents that may be relevant to the issue in the proceedings. As I mentioned earlier, it's important that appropriate steps are taken to identify and preserve all documents that might be relevant to the dispute. In practice, it will be for the individual members of the team who are connected with the matters, which are the subject of the claim, to ensure that they retain all potentially relevant documents and do not destroy any documents. It is therefore advisable to write to each employee explaining the obligation to preserve documents and asking them to take all steps to ensure that all documents are preserved and not destroyed. It is also advisable to ask the employees to countersign your letter to confirm they have understood their obligations and that they will comply with them. They should be asked to take the following steps immediately. To take, away, to take all necessary steps to preserve and make sure they do not alter, delete, destroy, or throw away any paper or electronic documents. They should not delete any documents, including hard copy documents, electronic data, and telephone messages. They should keep all electronic devices containing such information or documents. 
To guarantee a paper trail is kept, you should ensure that it, the notifications are signed and returned to you and reminders should be sent at appropriate intervals if no response is received. It's important that all steps in relation to disclosure processes are recorded as the court may ask to see evidence of the steps that have been taken. Where potentially relevant data is held on shared or central servers, you may need to get assistance from your IT team to preserve this data. It's also important to be aware that the obligation to ensure the documentation is preserved continues during the duration of the litigation. I'll now look at the sanctions which may be imposed by the court in the event that the obligation to preserve documents has not been met. If you fail to adequately preserve disclosable information, you could face a dispute into relation to the extent of compliance, which could include adverse inferences if you have not been able to produce the information you'd ought to have been able to produce, the striking out of part of your case, an order from the court to provide an explanation as to why documents have not been preserved or a wasted cost order. The following cases highlight some of these sections. First, in Earls and Barclays Bank, Barclays managed to successfully defend the claim against them. However, they were only able to recover 25% of their costs, mainly because they failed to carry out full disclosure. The case was a simple factual dispute and the bank failed to disclose electronic held material in their possession. It was apparent that if the documents had been disclosed, there would not have been the need for a time consuming expensive hearing. In the judgment, the judge disapproved of the conduct of Barclays and its lawyers, their conduct and the failure to preserve documents. The judge made comments that solicitors owe a duty to the court as officers of the court to make sure, as far as possible, that no relevant documents have been omitted from their clients' lists. The case is an extremely important reminder to litigants and their lawyers that the way in which a case is prepared can significantly affect the overall financial outcome. In the Glaxo case, following deletion of electronic and electronic platform, which led to the destruction of documents, the defendant failed to explain how the deletion occurred and that they were not aware of the need to preserve the said electronic platform. The judge in this case noted that it would serve a real purpose for the court to know this information, namely to enable the court and the claimants to know what had happened and whether there was a possibility that a serious error had occurred. It is clear, therefore, that when managing the claim, it is very important to pay close attention to the requirements around document preservation to ensure that compliance is achieved and in order to avoid sanctions being applied. I'll now pass you back to James on the topic of preserving the privilege um, of communications and documents. Thanks, Sophie. An important issue when a dispute has arisen is the need to ensure the privilege in privileged communications is maintained and to ensure as far as possible that there is no subsequent waiver or loss of such a privilege. Whilst there are various forms of legal privilege, we're essentially concerned here with legal advice privilege and in particular litigation privilege. Where a communication is privileged, party to which the privilege belongs will be entitled to withhold the communication from inspection in the court proceedings. Before we look at the practical steps that can be taken to help preserve privilege in communications, it's worth spending some time recapping on the key aspects of these two forms of privilege so that we can put these practical steps to preserve privilege into context. There are various definitions of legal advice privilege which have been given in the reported cases over the years, and these have been reformulated as the law in this area has developed. In the slide, we have set out the most recent formulation, which was given in the decision of the Court of Appeal at the beginning of last year, the judicial review case involving the Civil Aviation Authority in JET 2. As we see on the slide, the court summarised that for legal advice privilege to apply, there must be a communication, whether written or oral, between a client and a lawyer, or a lawyer and his client, made in confidence for the dominant purpose of giving or obtaining the legal advice. The key part of the case for the Court of Appeal to decide was whether the purpose of the advice must be the dominant purpose. And the Court of Appeal held that indeed it must be the dominant purpose of seeking or obtaining legal advice. And this therefore represented the development in legal advice privilege. Importantly, of course, this also applies to in-house lawyers being asked to give and giving legal advice to their internal clients, but it will not apply where they are providing commercial advice or advice not relating to their function as a lawyer. It should also be noted that this also covers foreign in-house lawyers who are not qualified in England and Wales. 
in last year's commercial court decision in PJSC Tatnet, it was held that legal advice privilege extends to foreign in-house lawyers, here yeah, Russian lawyers, and the court won't look into the qualification of the foreign lawyer. The issue as to who is the client was an important element of the Court of Appeal decision in Three Rivers and Bank of England No. 5. The liquidators of BCCI brought proceedings against the bank for misfeasance in public office relating to its supervision of BCCI before its collapse. The liquidators wanted disclosure of documents produced for a separate judge-led inquiry which had taken place into the collapse of BCCI. The bank had set up an inquiry unit to handle all communication between the bank and the inquiry. The liquidator sought disclosure of certain documents which had been prepared by the bank's employees with the intention of being given to the bank's solicitors. The Court of Appeal found that the inquiry unit was to be treated as the client for the purposes of assessing privilege and that other employees of the bank who were not in the inquiry unit were outside the lawyer-client relationship and communications and documents generated by them were not subject to legal advice privilege. This narrow definition of the client for the purposes of legal advice privilege has been criticised in subsequent cases. However, it remains the current formulation of the client until the Supreme Court decides to redefine and potentially widen the definition of the client in a later case. And since this narrow definition of the client in the Tree Rivers decision remains the current law, in order to maintain legal advice privilege given to your internal client, it is sensible to define your client group at the outset and confine your communications to that client group only. It is important to remember that communications outside that client group may not be privileged unless litigation privilege applies. Litigation privilege will apply to confidential communications between the client and its lawyer and third parties, where the dominant purpose of the communication is to obtain advice or information regarding the litigation or to assist the litigation. Where it isn't clear if litigation privilege applies, it will be necessary to determine whether legal advice privilege applies. For the purposes of today's presentation, we will assume for reasons which Sophie has mentioned earlier and which we'll come on to again shortly, that litigation privilege does apply following the sending or receipt of a letter of claim. In order for litigation privilege to arise, the communication must be confidential. There is presumption that communications and documents created as part of the relationship between the client and its lawyer will be confidential. And so this would extend to the relationship between the in-house lawyer and his or her internal client. When engaging third parties to assist with the claim and litigation, for example, an expert in the relevant field, it is important to make clear with the expert that all communications are to be confidential. Communication can take a variety of forms. As was noted in the Three Rivers Number no. 5 case, this covered letters, emails, computer disks, faxes, a client's notice of advice received. In terms of attachments to emails or enclosures to letters, in the CAA and JET 2 case, which I mentioned earlier, it was determined that emails and their attachments are to be analysed separately to determine whether privilege attaches to each. If the email is subject to litigation privilege or legal advice privilege, it does not automatically follow that the attachment will also be privileged. As we see on the slide, the Court of Appeal in that case referred to the long-standing principle that the document which is not privileged doesn't become privileged just because it is sent to lawyers, even if it is part of a request for legal advice. The attachment will itself need to satisfy the test of privilege if it is also to be treated as privileged. As we've seen, one of the elements of litigation privilege is that litigation must be ongoing or in reasonable contemplation. What does this mean? This has been described differently in the reported cases. In the leading case on litigation privilege, War and British Railways Board, the Court of Appeal cited with approval a passage from an earlier case in which reference was made to documents produced at a time when litigation was in reasonable prospect. In the Court of Appeal decision in Jarman and Lambert and Cook, Lord Justice Semming said that a mere apprehension of litigation generally is not sufficient. As we see on the slide, and as Sophie mentioned earlier, in the Aztecs and AstraZeneca case, Chief Master Marsh described as an obvious example of litigation being in reasonable contemplation the receipt of a letter of claim. In our presentation today, we are proceeding on the assumption that you will have either issued a letter of claim or received a letter of claim from your counterparty. And following this decision, it is appropriate to consider that litigation is in reasonable contemplation and that this element of the definition of litigation privilege has been satisfied. And of course, litigation privilege will also apply while the litigation is ongoing. As I mentioned earlier, War and British Railways Board is the leading case on litigation privilege. One of the issues in the case was whether a certain report was protected from disclosure by litigation privilege. 
The report had been prepared by two officers of the railway board after a collision resulting in the death of a locomotive driver whose widow had later brought litigation. The House of Laws found that the report contained material which had been collected for use of the board's lawyers in anticipated litigation. However, the court also found that it could not be shown that this was the dominant purpose of the report, so litigation privilege did not apply to it. The document may be created for more than one purpose for litigation privilege to apply, but the dominant purpose for creating the document must be actual or anticipated litigation. Privilege may be lost if the communication or document loses its confidential state, uh, status. In the context of documents and communications created by company employees, this would involve documents or communications being sent outside the company. It would hope that instances of any unauthorized sending of confidential materials outside the company would be rare. It may be that in certain circumstances, it may be necessary or advantageous to waive privilege or partially waive privilege, although very careful consideration needs to be given before taking such a step. As we saw earlier, current law following the Three Rivers Number no. 5 decision is that communications with parties who are not the client uh, will not be privileged uh, in terms of legal advice privilege. If privileged communications are sent to people outside the client group, then there is a risk that the privilege in those communications will be lost. In the context of maintaining legal advice privilege, as we've seen, it is sensible to set up a client group and keep those communications confined within that group. We've also seen if privileged communications are sent outside that group, then there's a risk that they will lose their legal advice privilege. This raises the question, what happens where your client group does not include the board of directors and you wish to communicate with them? Well, in the light of the three rules number five court of appeal decision, if the board is not part of your client group, then there is a risk that if you pass on legal advice to the board, it may not be covered by legal advice privilege. However, we're in the sphere of litigation privilege today as we're assuming uh, that a uh, letter of claim has been sent or received, then providing that the document or communication satisfies the elements of litigation privilege, it should be possible to communicate with the board about the litigation, even if the board is not part of the client group for day to day aspects of the litigation. However, you will need to think carefully about whether what you intend to send to the board satisfies the different elements of litigation privilege for this type of privilege to apply. At the outset of the dispute, it is sensible to provide guidance to those members of your commercial team who will be involved in the claim, i.e. those who will be in the client group, to make sure that all steps necessary to minimise the risk of privilege in communication documents being lost are followed. This is best done by sending a written note to the client group. Let's look at some of the points to be covered in the note. First, it is helpful to provide a short briefing on privilege so that the team members can place into context the guidelines which you are asking them to follow as it is sometimes unclear whether a document or part of a document may be protected by legal advice privilege or litigation privilege. It is preferable to avoid creating documents or communications in relation to the claim, or to limit this as far as reasonably possible, and not to create documents or communications unnecessarily. In terms of the commercial team members, in the notes you should ask them not to create any documents or uh, communications in relation to the claim, unless they have been specifically sought uh, they specifically sought and obtained your approval to do so. Communications which you are sending to the team, it is sensible to label them privileged and confidential. This label will not of itself render the communication privileged. However, it is at least helpful for this to highlight the fact that, that the communication is intended to be privileged and that it was, um, and this was your intention. For emails, which you are sending to your commercial colleagues, you may want to add the instruction, do not forward or share, again, in order to reduce the number of communications being sent. Further, if there is a debate as to whether the communication itself is subject to litigation privilege, but may instead only be subject to legal advice privilege, we've seen that if communications are sent outside the client group, they may lose their privilege status. Likewise, in their email response to you, where you have asked for a response, the commercial team should mark their email privileged and confidential. Team should avoid expressing views about the claim and should confine communication to factual matters. Similarly, members of the commercial team should avoid sending offline written communications amongst themselves as they may not meet the test for litigation privilege. The group should be reminded that the claim must be kept, kept confidential and is not discussed with anyone outside the company unless, for example, they have been expressly asked to deal with a particular third party, such as an expert, in relation to the claim. As your role may be split between providing legal advice and dealing with commercial matters, 
it is helpful wherever possible to separate communications on legal matters from separate commercial issues so that again it is clear what will be privileged. As we've seen for litigation privilege to apply, the dominant purpose of the uh, document must be the claim or the litigation. When preparing reports, you should ensure that when assessed objectively, the dominant purpose of the report or document is indeed the litigation, so that litigation privilege can be asserted. It may be that your company is claiming against a counterparty which is domiciled overseas, and your contract may provide for any disputes to be resolved by the courts of that overseas country, or alternatively before an arbitration tribunal is seated overseas. Or you may receive notification of a claim from your counterparty threatening to bring a claim in that court or arbitral tribunal. In these circumstances, it is important to understand from the very outset the rules of privilege which will apply to your communications about the claim, so that you do not create any documents which may later be disclosed during those proceedings. Whilst other common law countries may have rules on privilege which may be similar to our own, in civil law jurisdictions and other countries, the concepts of privilege may be very different. It may be that in some jurisdictions, the ability to withhold documents from disclosure may be very limited. It will therefore be necessary to obtain local law advice on this issue straight away. It may be clear at the outset which employees are likely to have factual information about the claim and who may subsequently be factual witnesses in the case. You should ensure that you are kept informed in the event that those employees are leaving the company for any reason. If such an employee is leaving, you should endeavour to meet with that person and obtain their evidence about the claim. You should also try to reach agreement with them for their continued cooperation once they've left the company and their agreement to provide a formal written statement in the future. If there is any doubt as to whether they will cooperative, be cooperative in the future, you should try to obtain a written statement from them before they leave the company. Lastly, very briefly, it may be that the claim uh, which the company is bringing or the claim which it has received from its counterparty is of a type or value which means that you will need to notify your insurance team. You should notify your insurance team at the very outset. So to wrap up, we've seen that the key considerations at the beginning of a dispute following the sending or receipt of a letter of claim will be the careful attention that will be required to the obligations to preserve disclosable documents in order to avoid the sanctions that may be imposed if these obligations are not met. It will also be very important to ensure, as far as possible, the privilege of future communications and documents is maintained. And having put in place measures to ensure that these matters are in hand, you will have a good platform from which to move forward with the claim or defence, or to instruct an external counsel if you wish to take that option at some later point. Thank you, and uh, that completes our presentation. And Kerry, do we have any questions at all? See, we only have one minute before the half hour is uh, on us. Hi, James. Thank you for that. Uh, so, as yes, as you say, as we've only got one minute, um, James will answer any questions you have after the webinar. I'll send them over to you directly, James. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you.